I, so, uh, I think he's somebody that uh, we all should get to know better and to speak with. Okay. All right, the biocultural origins of Egypt. Biocultural is a term that's used by many people in anthropology uh, today to refer to synthesizing information about populations, about peoples, about communities. Biology by itself won't give you the answer. Culture won't give you the answer in many situations. Uh, language won't give you the answer totally. The lines of evidence, though, should not be assumed to run together to be necessarily collected because we can speak, uh, uh, we can learn to speak different languages no matter who we are. Uh, we have Dr. Okamura here who's a Brazilian also, but she's a, I think she's of Japanese origin, is that right? So here we go. Uh, and, uh, and needless to say, we know that uh, we have, uh, uh, we have different ways to uh, put things together. However, we can look at different parallel lines of evidence or different lines of evidence to see if they run parallel. That's what I mean to say. And that's what we're going to do with Egypt. Origins of early Egypt, uh, you know, in, in, in sort of everyday terms, people want to Asian, European, or African. These are very big terms which in themselves are, uh, might have problems. And when we talk about origins, we can talk about things long ago or more recent <coughs> origins. And what do we mean? Well, we're talking about ancient Egypt. When we say origins, are we talking about the origins of the Egyptian state? You know, when they developed kings and, and a recognizable Egypt? Or are we talking about its more distant roots? Well, we can't identify anything that's necessarily Egyptian in the sense of the whole complex, the whole unit, but, identif but elements that surely went into it. And what does origins mean? We're talking about geography, language, culture, biological genealogy, or in big quotes, this notion of race. And uh, if I have a moment later on, I will, I will talk about the issues with the problems with the concept of race. Uh, and, and for me, let me just say this. Modern human beings do not structure into races. We use this word race very loosely and incorrectly. It has a technical meaning, and I insist on its technical meaning. I insist on that. And, and uh, we'll talk about it later. We want to explore objective criteria. And when we talk about geography, as I mentioned earlier, you can talk about physical geography, the location of a place, cultural geography. We already talked about this. You know, Egypt is the gift of the Nile. And uh, here we have a cross section of the Nile Valley. We have the river here. And uh, let me see if I can get this in focus. We have the flood plain. This is where most of the Egyptian most of Egyptian life took place just up here and near the flood plain because this is where food came from. And we have the, uh, the low terraces in the desert. This was sort of the topography, a slice through the Nile Valley. And like I said earlier, we have the issue of understanding how the environment was used to create the culture, or what elements from the uh, environment comment on the origins of the culture. There is no evidence that something called the Egyptian community or Egyptian culture was created in Syria and that a whole community of people came to the Nile Valley. Do things like that happen? Sure they do. The pilgrims came to America and they came with notions of, you know, uh, Protestantism, Magna Carta, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, clearly formed in England. They didn't like the king, but everything else they brought. They brought British culture to the New World. Here we have the, a language map of Africa. Uh, language is also a, a part of culture. It's part of this origins questions. The, uh, the top part of the map with the vertical cross hatches and the, and, the, and, the has, and, the, and the different lines represent the, the diagonal, the, I'm sorry, the uh, Afro-Asiatic language family. This is not all of the, uh, uh, the families now. There's some new families and, and some new members of the family. Uh, this is an old slide. Uh, Omotic, which is spoken only in southern Ethiopia. 
down in here. And uh, there's another language, it's a dead language called Ongata, spoken only by less than 10 people now, which is also felt to be a member of Afroasiatic. All right. Uh, this obviously doesn't have ancient Egyptian on it because the reason we have Semitic in North Africa across what I call super Saharan Africa is because of uh, during the Islamic period, Arabic was adopted by people. And in some cases, you had uh, groups of Arabs who actually came into North Africa, such as the Halalian invasion in the, uh, the uh, 11th century. No, in the, in the 12th century. Oh, and the other language families of interest in this area uh, would be uh, the Nilo-Saharan language family. Modern Nubians speak Nilo-Saharan. Uh, you find Nilo-Saharan languages spoken in Ethiopia. Across the belt through Darfur, fur, the fur language itself is Nilo-Saharan. And you have Nilo-Saharan speakers along the bend of the Niger River as well as in East Africa. The Song Hai in uh, West Africa speak uh, Nilo-Saharan language. They're almost an isolate there, kind of here by themselves. Uh, another interesting story in deep time African history. And people like the Maasai uh, in the Southern Sudanese also speak Nilo-Saharan languages. Okay. Ancient Egypt, <coughs> old and new, spoken Afro-Asiatic, I mean, uh, Afro-Asiatic language, ancient Egyptian, sometimes called Afrasan by Chris Eret, uh or Afrasian by the Russians, by Dakanov. Nubian, Nilo-Saharan. In the Sahara, we have both Afro-Asiatic and Nilo-Saharan languages. And in the Sudan today, we have both languages spoken as well. This is one notion of how these languages may be connected genealogically. This is Roger Blench, who actually lives right here in Cambridge. Uh, this is a tree that he published. Uh, in this, he has Semitic languages spoken in the Near East, splitting off early. He suggested there may be an Erythraic group, that Egyptian Berber Chadic, spoken around uh, Lake Chad and, and northern Nigeria, but also in other parts of the Sahara. Beja spoken in the Sudan and Egypt even today, and Cushitic languages. And, uh, this gets revised often. Here you have a picture from the great Russian linguist uh, Diakonov, Igor Diakonov, who died a few years ago. This is from his book, uh, uh, Afrasian Languages, published in 1965. Uh, he has the family of Afroasiatic originating uh, near the Horn of Africa, either in the Southern Sahara, the Sudan, or uh, some people say in Ethiopia proper. Uh, he has a Semitic branch going in across the Red Sea into Arabia. Other people have it going in through the north. Uh, again, histor historical linguistics is a very interesting field that's still under development. Now, you, you can't look at this and assume that you had a bunch of people line up and say, okay, today we're all going to march out from the Horn of Africa and we're going to split up. This, di this is just a sort of a schematic. Don't think of it that people, you know, got together and said, okay, we're going to split up now. It doesn't quite work that way. We, we're not going to talk about it. But this, uh, uh, this is, a, is a way to conceptualize the cradle land of the family and the fact that its daughters emerge out of a, a group of what's called dialect clusters that would have been there. But, but don't think of, of something called Egyptian sort of coming into being right here and marching up, or Semitic being formed. Although there is one linguist who does think that Semitic actually, actually emerged in the horn. That's a minority opinion of one, Grover Hudson. But he does believe that uh, based on uh, the, the age of, or the amount of diversity in the Semitic languages in the Horn of Africa. Okay. We're in Cambridge, so we'll have to mention Colin Renfrew. Uh, the Nostratic hypothesis was developed